So we are concluding our good afternoon all. A warm welcome to you all. So I am Inna Sabu, and I will be the moderator for the section. And the session is handled by Dr. Ankita Gupta, Assistant Professor of Department or Head Department of English, GGDSG College, Kheri Gurna, Punjab, India. And she has six years of teaching experience, and she is a gold medalist from University of Jammu. And her area of specialization is in the field of fourth world literature, Australian Aboriginal literature, and Dalit literature. She has published many research papers in peer-reviewed international and national journals and contributed, contributed chapters in various books. She has a special love for poetry and has five poems published in the international anthologies to her credit. She has also authored one book on William Shakespeare, the literary bar. So I welcome you, ma'am. I hope you are here, Dr. Ankita Gupta, ma'am. And also, I would like to welcome okay. all the participants. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, all the participants who are going to present the paper. So the part participants are Dr. Priya Kumari S. V. along with Ms. Supriya S. V. Hekam Sanu Jenny, Sindhu Thomas, Vidyavadi Gautu. So here are certain guidelines for your participants. You have 10 to 12 minutes to present the paper. So even if anyone have any questions or queries, you can post the questions in the chat box. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. A very good afternoon to one and all, to yes. the moderator. Thank you for introducing me and being generous uh, about the uh, introduction. Uh, without much ado, I think uh, we are running on schedule, so I won't take a lot of time. And uh, I thank uh, Bishop College Kerala for giving me an opportunity to be the chairperson of the technical session 5 and Cape Comorian Trust. So without much ado, I would like the first presenter, Dr. Priya Kumari SV, along with Ms. Supriya SP, to present their paper. Do we have Dr. Priya Kumari and Ms. Supriya in the meeting today? No, ma'am, they are not there. So we can move on to the next person. Okay, so Haikam Chanu Jenny, research scholar from Manipur University. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, so how would you like to go about the paper? Do you have a presentation? Uh, yes. I would like okay. to like present it now. Okay, and uh, uh, do you want to take the questions towards the end of the session or after your presentation? Hello. Uh, I can take it like after the session also, like after the presentation also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think uh, we'll take all the questions. You can just uh, post them in the chat box, and we'll take the, all the questions after the session is over. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Haikam. I'm a research scholar in political science department of Manipur University. The topic which I'm presenting today is gender inequality in education in India, an overview. Uh, first of all, gender equality means that women and men and girls and boys all enjoy the same rights, resources, opportunities, and protections. It also means that girls and women have those rights, capabilities, resources, opportunities, to make strategic choices and decisions about the course of their lives without the fear of coercion and violence. Gender equality is also a core human rights principle and a valuable end in itself. In most societies around the world, gender norms favor men and boys. Across India, gender inequality um, is prevalent and that results in unequal opportunities while the girls face the situation of the most disadvantaged Girls tend to face extensive limitations on their ability to move freely and make decisions affecting their work, education, marriage, and social relationships, while boys tend to experience more freedom. There are certain barriers in India that prevent gender equality. Some of them are poverty. Uh, first, poverty. Poverty is one of the root causes of gender discrimination. Women comprises the majority of the population below the poverty line. As many populations are poor, there is dependence of women to men, causing gender disparity. Also, gender biases against girls' education 
women's uh, limited mobility, gender gaps and wages all contribute to, to difficulties of escaping poverty intergenerationally through vicious cycles between poverty and gender inequality. Uh, next is illiteracy. Gender-wise literacy rates in India showcase the wide gap between men and women. There is literacy gap of 21.59% in 2001 and 16.68% in 2011 census. Also, there is discrimination on girls as uh, most parents are unwilling to spend on girls' education, thinking it will have no value as they will only serve their husbands and in-laws in the future. So, efforts should be made to ensure equal access to education for women and girls, eliminate discrimination, universalize education, eradicate illiteracy, create a gender-sensitive educational system, increase enrollment and retention ratio of girls, and improve the quality of education to facilitate lifelong learning. Uh, next is the patriarchal Indian society. Uh, Indian society is a deeply rooted patriarchal society. We can see discrimination based on the patriarchal system it is also a violation of human rights when discrimination is based on gender. Uh, social reformers, revivalists, and liberals perceive the education of women as an instrument for changing their subordinated status in society. And also the dowry system, due to the dowry system, many times it has been seen that women are seen as a liability and are often subjected to subjugation and are given second-hand treatment, whether in education or other amenities. The government has come up with many laws like the Dowry Prohibition Act and reforms to eradicate the dowry system and uplift the girl-child status by bringing in many schemes. However, still we can see the dowry system being practiced in many parts of India. And also another is the early marriage. Uh, like uh, The child marriage subjugates girls and women it is often the result of entrenched gender inequality, which disproportionately affect the girls by the practice. Uh, the legal current minimum age of marriage is 21 and 18 for men and women respectively in India. Although early marriage is practiced in India, there has been significant progress in reducing child marriages in India. The decline may be result from multiple factors, such as increased literacy of mothers, better access to education for girls, strong legislation, and migration from rural areas to urban centers. However, we can still find this practice prevalent in rural areas, uh, which hampers the growth of gender equality. Uh, there are also other social practices like the caste system, where today we see much caste-based discrimination. Uh, here, lower caste women are discriminated not only by the people of higher caste, but also within their own communities being a low caste and being a female can massively impoverish women. And another is domestic violence, where violence against women is highly prevalent in India. Almost 70% of women are victims of domestic violence. And also there is female infanticide, which is an evil social practices where a newborn female child is deliberately killed. The patriarchal nature of our society has caused this evil to continue since centuries. Uh, so coming to the importance of education, education is generally seen as society's foundation which brings economic wealth, social prosperity, and political stability. Education can reduce inequality and disparity, and through education one can acquire knowledge and be empowered. And education also increases the likelihood that women will look after their own well-being along with that of their family. Women needs to enlighten in all. Needs to be enlightened in order to empower themselves, and that education is one way to make aware of its surroundings and empower themselves. It also it can also help overcome constraints on capabilities, partly through developing the knowledge, understanding, and skills that all girls and boys, women and men, need to achieve what they value for their lives. This means ensuring an education system that allows all individuals, irrespective of gender, to develop their capabilities and freedoms. 
Also, there are provisions in the Indian constitution that promote education to ensure equality and development. And for many girls, gender inequality is the feature of both in their lives and in their educational experience. Also, importance should be given to the secondary education as well. With secondary education, women can get better paying jobs and positions of responsibility. Okay. Uh, also, there are initiatives taken to promote gender equality in education. Some of them are the universalization of elementary education, the to inserted Article 21A in the Constitution, which made free and compulsory education a fundamental right for all children in the age group of 6 to 14 years, and also the Right to Education Act 2009 is another major landmark in the education sector in India, ensuring free and compulsory education to children. Also, Article 45 of the Constitution of India has provision for early childhood care and education to children below the age of six years. Uh, and another initiative taken is the um, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, which is an ambitious program for achieving the goal of universalization of elementary education, which is launched in 2001. Betty um, Bachao, Betty Parao Yojana is also another initiative to address the declining child sex ratio and focuses on challenging mindsets and deep-rooted patriarchy in the social, in the societal system. It takes various steps in protecting the girl child and enabling her education. Also, there are various scholarship schemes too, where scholarships are provided mainly to backward students for, for their education. And post-metric scholarship for saddle caste students are also provided as financial assistance to the saddle caste students studying at post matriculation to enable them to complete their education. A separate educational institution for girls like the Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalaya scheme was launched in July 2004 to provide education to girls at the primary, primary level. It is primarily for the underprivileged and rural areas where the literacy level for girls is very low. And also initiatives like free traveling for girls, like in the states of Punjab, Delhi, and Tamil Nadu, have initiated free travel for women and girls for their safety and financial security. It also helps to empower them. So these are some of the initiatives taken to promote gender equality in India. Uh, now coming to the conclusion, we can tell that Gender equality is extremely essential to realize the goal of women empowerment. Also, we see that girls and boys are treated differently in societies and typically girls face various forms of discrimination and that only government can work at the scale necessary to provide universal access to education and ensure the right of all children, especially the marginalized and poor, to an education that is free and of good quality. Girls and boys Women and men should be equipped with knowledge, values, attitudes, and skills to tackle gender disparities. Also, gender equality is not only a woman's issue. Men should also involve in ending women's subordination and also hoping that gender discrimination and gender bias will reduce in future by implementing various schemes for girls. Uh, so here comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an interesting paper. Uh, I have a few observations about the paper, and I would like to share them uh, you know, uh, just right now. Otherwise, after the after every paper, some thoughts just skip your mind. Uh, you have extensively used the term equality, gender equality, uh, but you know there is a thin line of difference between the term equality and equity. Like when we talk about equality. Uh, it means that we are providing the same resources or opportunities to everybody, be it a male or a female. But equity, equity, I think, is an appropriate word to use here because um, when we talk about uh, females, even in that particular gender, you will have an hierarchy inside that particular gender of females. So equity, uh, you know, is a comprehensive term which which allocates resources and opportunities which are needed 
to reach an equal outcome for example if we uh, look at women uh, like inside the gender of female we will have women from the dalit section or from uh, you know the marginal section of the society so they they will face lot more challenges as compared to women who are you know from a uh, maybe a say a good economic background so equity i think it would be an appropriate term when we talk about uh, you know gender discrimination because gender discrimination is not just between male and female gender discrimination happens within the same sex also so this is one observation i had about your paper nevertheless uh, i mean this is just a suggestion you can incorporate that in your paper thank you so much uh thank you ma'am i think like equity word will be much more appropriate to use here in my yeah. paper <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you okay uh thank so you. the thank you uh next presenter is sindhu thomas do we have uh, miss sindhu thomas with us excuse me ma'am yeah ma'am this is priya kumari <laughs> The first presenter for that session. We are there now. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. ma'am. Please continue. Okay. Yeah. So, Dr. Priya Kumari and Ms. Supriya okay. S. P. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. Myself, uh, Dr. Priya Kumari S. P. And this paper is co-authored by uh, Ms. Supriya S. P. Uh, the title of our paper is Women Economic Empowerment Through Capacity Building Training Program, a study with special reference to Ruth Seti Ujwe. The, content, the flow of this presentation goes like this. Introduction, objective of the study, hypothesis, research methodology, data analysis and interpretation, finding of the study, conclusion and reference. Let me begin with the introduction to the study. Gender disparity and Empowerment for a poor, vulnerable woman is a burning topic of discussion from the past many years. In order to enhance gender equality and improving the socio-economic status of the women in society, capacity-building training programs serve as an effective strategy. Customized cap capacity-building training program should be designed in order to fill the gaps in capacity, knowledge, or skill affecting women empowerment. In order to support the initiative for women empowerment, the government of india has promoted various schemes which will enhance the employability skill of skills of women rural uh, rural development and self employment training institute that is root set is one such initiative working towards elevating unemployment in rural youth by providing capacity building training programs this study focuses on evaluating the effectiveness of capacity building training program offered by root set ujre towards economic empowerment of rural women these are the following objectives which we have taken for our study to study the association between the various demographical factors and settlement status of the respondents to identify the factors influencing employability of the trainees to identify the age group to which majority of the settled trainee belongs to determine the settlement rate of trainees belonging to different training programs so these are the following uh, hypothesis we have set seven hypotheses to test our uh, study and uh, the research methodology for the study goes like this research design the purpose of this study is to evaluate the impact of capacity building training program offered by root set ujre on women economic empowerment and also to come up with suggestion for enhancing the training and development process for women empowerment research approach the re respondent for the studies are female trainees who have undergone training program from rooset during the year 2017 to 2021 so secondary data has been collected for this duration sampling method purposive sampling has been adopted so that we can collect the data of the female respondents from uh, that uh, sample and the sample size is uh, from 141 female trainees who have undergone training program from rooset we have selected 94 female trainees and data collection method we have collected it as a secondary source from root set the available information from root set we have taken and data analysis method quantitative approach is used to analyze the data and interpret the result 
uh, the impact of capacity building training program offered by the Roadset Ujre on the settlement status of the trainees evaluated through various factors such as so we have considered age, caste, education qualification, marital status, uh, family occupations and uh, uh, occupation before undergoing the training and the relevant experience. So my co-author will present the data. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so myself, Ms. Supriya SP. So here I'm before you to present the data analysis and interpretation part of our study. So this data has been analyzed using the R software and we have presented the uh, results graphically and also we have used some statistical tests such as Fisher's exact test and chi-square test for independence of attributes to interpret the results. Uh, here is a figure which represents the demographic profile of the trainees and here we have four graphs. The first graph shows the age group of trainees and from this uh, we can make out that majority of the trainees that is about 45 percent belong to the age group 30 to 40. The second graph shows the caste categories of trainees and here we can make out that majority of the trainees that is about 66 percent belong to the caste category OBC. And the third graph shows the educational qualification of the trainees and from this graph uh, we can observe that majority of the trainees, that is about 26% of the trainees have SSLC as their educational qualification, 25% are graduates, 23% of the trainees have PUC as their educational qualification and so on. And uh, the third graph shows the marital status of the trainees in which we can observe that majority of the trainees, that is about 54% of the trainees are married, whereas 46% of the trainees are unmarried. Here is another figure that represents the work profile of the trainees and here we have three graphs. So the first graph shows the family occupation of the trainees and from this graph we observe that 27% of the trainees have agriculture as their family occupation, 25% of the trainees have business as their family occupation and 25% belong to the family occupation category others. The second graph shows the occupation of trainees before attending the training program and here we can observe that majority of the trainees, that is about 62% of the trainees are unemployed. Uh, the third graph shows the work experience, relevant experience of the trainees before attending the training program and here we can observe that majority of the trainees, that is about 68% have no work experience whereas 26% of the trainees have work experience of about 0 to 1 year. Uh, here, uh, here we have tested hypothesis which states that there is no relationship between age group of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training against the alternative that is there is a relationship between age group of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. So here we have used the Fisher exact test and we have obtained the p-value of about 0.4591 which is insignificant. Hence, we do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no relationship between age group of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. And here we have tested another hypothesis that which states that there is no relationship between caste category of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. And here we have used Fisher exact, Fisher exact test and we have obtained the p-value of about 0 0.1604 which is insignificant. And hence, we conclude that there is no relationship between caste category of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. Uh, here we have our third hypothesis which states that there is no relationship between educational qualification of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. And once again, we have used Fisher, Fisher's exact test which gives a p-value of about 0.5926 which is insignificant. And from this we conclude that there is no relationship between education qualification of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. We have our fourth null hypothesis has there is no relationship between marital status of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. Here we have used chi-square chi test which has given us a p-value of about 0.3543 which is insignificant and from this we conclude that there is no relationship between marital status of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. Uh, the fifth hypothesis states that there is no relationship between family occupation of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. Here we have used Fisher, Fisher's exact test and we have uh, got a p-value of about 0 0.0099 which is significant and from this we conclude that we reject the null hypothesis and uh, it states 
uh, and hence we conclude that there is a relationship between family occupation of the trainees and settlement status after undergoing the training. The sixth hypothesis states that there is no relationship between occupation of the trainees before undergoing the training and settlement status after undergoing the training. And here we have used Fisher's exact test and we have obtained a p-value of 0 0.0386, which is significant. And from this, we reject the null hypothesis and we conclude that there is a relationship between occupation of the trainees before undergoing the training and settlement status after undergoing the training program. And the seventh null hypothesis states that there is no relationship between trainees having relevant experience before undergoing the training and settlement status after undergoing the training. So we have implemented Fisher's exact test, which has given us a p-value of about 0 0.5946. 5914, which is insignificant, and from this we conclude that there is no relationship between trainees having relevant experience before undergoing the training and settlement status after undergoing the training. And uh, from the seven uh, testing of hypothesis, we can conclude that family occupation and trainees occupation before undergoing the training are the only factors that significantly influence the settlement status of the trainees after attending the training program. Uh, here we have uh, represented the age group to which majority of the settled trainees belong. So we have 11 training programs to which uh, the female trainees have enrolled during the year 2017 to 2021. Uh, so uh, in the training program duty parallel management, so majority of the settled trainees belong to the age group 30 to 40. Similarly, in the training program computerized accounting, majority of the settled trainees belong to the age group 20 to 30. Uh, similarly, in desktop publication, we have 40 to 50 and so on. And uh, from this table, we can conclude that majority of the settled trainees belong to the age group of about 30 to 40 years. Uh, here we have, uh, through this graph, we have illustrated the different training programs to which the trainees were enrolled. Um, and we have calculated the settlement rate, uh, settlement rate of trainees with respect to each training program. Uh, so here are the settlement rate with respect to the 11 training programs enrolled by the trainees. Uh, and we can observe that uh, the settlement rate of the beauty parlor management is 80% of computerized accounting is 70%, desktop publishing is 25% and so on. Um, and this is a figure representing the settlement rate of different training programs. And from this, we conclude that majority of the trainees have settled down after undergoing the training in their area of interest from Root City, Ujrit. Uh, now, the next session will, uh, next part will be presented by Dr. Priya Kumari. So, the finding of this uh, study uh, indicates that uh, age, caste, and education are not the deciding factor to measure the impact of training program on employability. And it also indicates that marital status is also not an influencing factor on employability. And it's also shown that family occupation of the training has a significant impact on their employability. And uh, then we have uh, seen that uh, uh, there is a relationship between the occupation of the trainee before undergoing the training program and settlement status after undergoing the training. And uh, there is uh, no relationship between the trainees having relevant experience before undergoing the training program and settlement status after undergoing the training program. The study indicates that the family occupation and trainees occupation before undergoing the training program are the only factors that have significant influence on the settlement status of the trainee. The study reveals that majority of the settled uh, trainees belongs to the age group of 30 to 40 years. And we have seen that uh, the effectiveness of capacity building training program offered by the road setting uh, towards the economic empowerment of women. So let us conclude this. Economic empowerment of women helps to reduce the dependency on men, which play a vital role in overcoming gender inequality. The decision-making capacity of women enhances the socio-economic status in the society, which in turn leads to social, uh, sustainable economic growth. Rootset is one such institution which focuses on sustainable economic growth by providing various capacity-building training programs to enhance employability skills among rural youth. From the study, it is clear that various capacity building training programs designed by Rootset for women helps to upgrade their employability skills in their area of interest, thus empowering the women economically. Thank you. Thank you so much.
I congratulate uh, both the presenters for an extensive uh, research paper. Uh, you have uh, very well uh, put, put forth the findings of your research and it has been elaborately done. Uh, I would just like to ask one thing that uh, what kind of a relationship, like you mentioned that you have found out that there is a direct relationship between family occupation and the settlement status. So what kind of a relation uh, could you deduce out of your uh, the study between this uh, hypothesis 5? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Uh, actually, the factors that we have considered to check the relationship between uh, the settlement status, we have found the relevance of family occupation and the candidate occupation. Means they are into that line before they have gone for the uh, training program. So after getting that training program, it was easy for them to get settled down in their area of interest. So means actually they were interested in that field. Like people who were doing tailoring, after getting a proper training, they got a confidence to take up it as a micro enterprise for them. So there is a relationship between that occupation which they were carrying out and after getting a training, they have got the idea that how they can take it up for income generation activity. Okay. Okay. So this is a very recent study and you know the new economic, uh, the new education policy is also emphasizing on skill development courses for, yes. for the students. So your study is relevant that way is also really uh, commendable work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You, ma Thank you so much ma'am. Next speaker, do we have uh, Madam Sindhu Thomas with us? The third speaker for the session. Sindhu Thomas, are you there? Sindhu Thomas? No, ma'am, we didn't have Sindhu Thomas here. Okay. Uh, Vidyavati Gautur, the next speaker for the session. Vidyavati Gautur? I think he is also not here. Uh, so the list that I have have only these uh, four names with me. So two of them have already presented, and uh, Madam Sindhu Thomas and Madam Vidyavati Gotu. Should we wait for them or conclude the session? Yeah, let's wait for them, ma'am, for two minutes. Okay. Have they joined? No, ma'am, they both are both are not present here. So I think okay. So that uh, that means we can conclude the session then. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the session was quite interesting as uh, the overall uh, topic of the conference is also, you know, it is a very pressing topic, keeping in con consideration uh, the gender uh, component to it and, you know, the current political scenario where we see the Talibanis overtaking uh, Afghanistan and you know, when this book, The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, uh, when this book came in 1949, in her book, uh, in one of her interviews, she said that it will become an old, dated book after a while. But even in 2021, we do not see gender equity, you know, coming forth on the podium. We still see, uh, you know, situations like uh, 
what is happening in afghanistan right now with the overpowering of uh, you know the scenario by the talibanis and we see that the i mean there is a complete violation of human rights but one sex in particular is facing the repercussions more than anybody and that is the female sex be it a part be, you know if you go back to the partition of india or you go back to any trauma or any war situation women have always suffered more than the other sex so this topic will never lose the relevance and we will have endless conferences and you know seminars where we come and speak about and we have our voice uh, voices you know collectively talking about equality and equity and things like that but in the current scenario has that changed that 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 really matters that have we actually attained that you know a position or that place for women where they can feel safe so the answer to this is no and you know such conferences will always keep on happening so these studies are very relevant both the papers uh, by jenny hickam gender inequality in india where she rightly pointed out that uh, india is a patriarchal society and uh, this uh, literacy gap which is still 16.6% is a very high uh, you know figure and we have to narrow down somehow because you know education is the only empowering thing that a woman can have that's the most empowering weapon a woman can have you know the power of pen as malala says that the power of pen is greater than the power of sword so you know we have to really come up and educate our uh, a girl child and the second paper uh, was uh, you know very elaborate study by dr priya kumari and ms supriya on uh, the women economic empowerment so both the papers i really congratulate both the speakers of the session both the papers were uh, thoroughly uh, curated and i thank uh, bishop college kerala for giving me the opportunity to chair the session moderator of the session and also cape kanoran trust for uh, for this uh, uh, you know elaborately done uh, conference on gender studies the topic uh, which will never become uh, you know redundant or old or date so it will always uh, you know be the uh, responsibility of us all of all academicians at least to bring forth the maladies of the second sex which is the female sex thank you and over to you moderator thank you thank you for accepting our invitation and being part of this 3 day virtual conference thank you so much ma'am and uh, you can leave the leave this particular platform and uh, once again thank you so much